Hi, Holly. Hey, Finn. I'm so excited to uh, chat with you for a little bit today. I've been wanting to do this for a while. I have too. I'm just like, this is fantastic. Um, I love that we came up with these questions that I feel like are going to serve both of our audiences. Um, I have been wanting to share your voice with my followers forever. So I'm just, I'm like, yay, a place to collaborate. So thank you for joining me here. Yeah, thank you. And I also too, it's like I've been wanting, um, a lot of gay men that I talk to are wanting voices out there to, to connect with. And so I've been sharing some of your work on my newsletters and in my mm -hmm. feed and guys are like, oh, who is she? And she is, and then someone called you like this queen. And I was like, <laughs> I was like I know she is, Say attention, listen up, so. Oh, perfect. Hey, Finn, um, just for my viewers, can you take a minute to introduce yourself? Tell us about you. Totally. Um, I'm a sex and intimacy coach and I work primarily with gay men. It's just the niche that's kind of found me, I think. But um, mm -hmm. I'm actually an ex-minister from the South and came out of the closet late in life and found my way into this work um, because of my own issues around sexuality and intimacy. And it's just been, it, I, I say it, like, it found me, like the path was just something that pulled me and pulled me. So I work with all people, not just gay men, but um, mm -hmm. that is my niche. And primarily around a coaching model where I encourage guys to go do an experiment with different play work that I give them and then they come back and process that with me. Beautiful. And that's what our time together is going to be today. Just for, so to give you guys a framework, we're aiming for about 10 minutes. Um, so you're going to get to hear more about what Finn does um, through our chat today. Uh, for my part, I'm a somatic psychologist, which means body psychologist, marriage, licensed marriage and family therapist, and certified sex therapist. Um, somatic psychology is really this bridge between the body and the mind. So I pay as much attention to what my clients' bodies are saying as they as they are with their words. And it really only made sense to me to overlay somatic psychology with sex therapy because sex is so somatic. So mm -hmm. I was like, I want to understand what happens sexually and I want to understand what happens in the body and I wonder, um, want to understand what happens in the mind and how we can bring all these together. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, let's talk about what you and I do, how it's similar and how it's different. Yeah, totally. And I love, I totally agree. Like somatic psychology, how could it not be a part of sexuality in the therapeutic yeah. process? Right, right. We have to, we have to pay attention. Finn, in your coaching work, do you touch clients? I do not touch clients. Okay. Not in my coaching work, nor in the workshops that I lead either. Um, I want to keep a space where people are touching themselves or each other or in their own practice so that they are developing those connections in themselves and not being a part of that process as intimately with myself and them. Okay, tell me a little bit more about that because I think people are going to have questions here. So if you are leading a workshop, uh -huh. if you are uh, leading a couple together, they are touching each other. You're, you're instructing the participants how to touch each other, but you are not involved in the touching. Exactly. Yeah, in a workshop setting. So in, in private sessions on you know, Zoom that I do with people, it's mm -hmm. more of a counseling base where I'm yep. just unpacking with them and they do that later, the touching aspect. In workshops, I'm actually holding a space live holding space with them and, and then touching themselves and going through instructed exercises and practices to help them really uncover something. And then we do group process after that to talk about it and to help them integrate. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, my answer is similar, but with an even stricter barrier. So do I touch clients 100%? No, I would lose my <laughs> license if I did. Um, there is a firm boundary on that, like not even, not even a little bit. Um, and again, as a sex therapist, I give a ton of homework that that's what makes, um, marriage and family therapy different from somatic psychology. So already the body element is brought in there. And then with a layer further of sex therapy, there's even more touched base homework. So again, every week my clients will take homework home to, to practice on themselves or with a partner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I totally agree with that. I think for me, I think it's really important that they don't actually start to share that, that boundary with me being crossed mm -hmm. because I don't want to be a part of that process with them as a provider of any kind. I want them to have a, a spacious boundary where they explore in their own process and, you know, same, same, same. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Um, have you ever fallen in love with a client? Um, 
No, I don't. I mean, I, but that's a tricky phrase, right? Falling in love yeah. because it like kind of assumes a lot. And I mean, like a process of like being infatuated maybe or no, no. Um, what happens is I will have a client maybe that I have like a sweet spot for and it really like tender feelings. And I kind of look at that and like, what is this about for me? And how does this, what does this have to do with this person? And how are they maybe like enrolling me in certain patterns? And how is this part of some of my patterns, you know? But I do have people sometimes where they really activate a sweet spot in me mm -hmm. emotionally and um i find that to be really helpful and tender but i keep an eye on that yeah yeah i like that answer um i do too like this is it's such a tricky question so have i ever fallen in love with a client i can 100 percent say no to that and I do my best work when I love my clients. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's a risky thing to say as a therapist and people are probably like, ah, it's true. Like from this, I don't even know if it's the, from the place of somatic psychology, but I know when I have a profound affection, even, I don't know, maybe adoration, um, appreciation, curiosity for my client. Like in some, I can love or they let me love them more easily than others. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you when that, that bond is there, and I don't even know if love is the right word for it, mm -hmm. but we both feel it. Yeah. Right. And it's, but it's nothing about romantic love. It's just, um, gosh, just like a, a, such an openness with safety that is created more easily with some clients than others. I totally agree. And I have a hard time imagining falling in love as we, you know, hear that right. phrase with a client because it's such a, it's such a different work. Um, that's not really what I'm in it for. So. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay. Finn, in your workshops, what happens if you become aroused? Um, I never become aroused in my workshops. I can't like, I'm in such a different space. And then that sound that, that may sound dishonest, but it's true. I mean, I've been like, in, in fact, like I tread a line sometimes where I'm like, I don't want to be in a space where I have like zero sexual energy available. So right. that's kind of like maybe even re replicating a dynamic for them of like, okay, should I hide this? But I also don't want it to be like, oh yeah, let me see. You know, I don't want people to feel that and think, you know, and I've, flirted with like how much you know I've taught Tantra workshops under Jason yeah. Tantra and have been you know facilitating nude um and it's bizarre for me because then like if I notice someone looking at me and I don't know if they're like um you know consuming me or judging me or whatever it makes me very uncomfortable because I'm like no 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 no, that's not what I want I want you to look at you and focus on me right. um so I don't get aroused in in the in the workshops it's almost like I can't access it in my own self because I'm holding a space and paying attention to a lot of other stuff. And it's difficult for me to feel my own kind of uh, narratives or turn ons. It really is. Yeah, I, you just said it perfectly. It's not even an option, not because it's bad, um, not because it's not allowed. It's it's like telling me to go bowling and drive at the same time. Like, well, I can't, I cannot do those two things together because I literally, I'm thinking about the process. I'm tracking everything. I am, I'm a therapist that is just, when it's my, that 50 minutes, I am in it. Like mm -hmm. I am just so in it and I work my ass off. And it's so, so weird to say that when you're sitting your butt in your chair, but it's, mm -hmm. it's exhausting work because I'm just, attentive and mm -hmm. and all the things especially somatically that i feel like i need to track um and i talk about sex for hours and hours and hours on end and i have people mm -hmm. say like how do you not get turned on um it's really curious to me it's really interesting it's work i love like i have so much interest and passion for it but it doesn't it's not never about me it's about mm -hmm. the context what does that story mean for you yep. sometimes it's even like because I'll feel clients bait me with like a really sexy story that they think is sexy. And it literally like can't land because I am working. Right. So I'm like, well, what are you, what is it about you that's telling me the story? What do you need from me right now? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, I'm in a different part of myself. You know, it's like, I'm like, okay, Finn that has sex is over here. This is Finn that's yep. holding a space for you. So when it comes through, I can, I can hold a space for like eroticism in general. Yeah. And, and in that sense, I guess it's not like I'm aroused. I'm not getting hard and like, but I'm just kind of like feeling sexual energy, but it's not, you know, in the sense that I, I feel like, you know, being in nature truly is right. like sexual energy. And it's that it's not like, how can I re like put this through my genitals and make it into some kind of like, thing you know it's, yep. it's holding space for which is very different than being like not self-conscious and being in your own kind of sexual 
underworld. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not I love what I'm that. Doing. <laughs> Perfect. Um, through your work, what's the difference between sex for pleasure and sex for validation? Oh, I love that question. Um, that question, you know, I, when I think about that question, it makes me think about your work too, about the connection and um, pleasure piece around, I know there's three of those bullets, yeah. but um, validation, I think it's like sex for like, am I good enough? Like, am I that guy? Do I really, am I doing this right? You know, that kind of like, and, and I'm not saying that that's bad. I think that's like one entry level and maybe even one set of needs that we get through sex. But for yeah. me, like shifting from that into pleasure is such a healing journey for me and what I want to provide for my clients because I want to like show how when we have sex for pleasure, we're connecting more to our own bodies. We're utilizing our own internal um wounds that need to be healed we're like our own narratives that we're wanting to craft in our lives our aspirations that are wanting to come through it's like this mm -hmm. kind of, and when we're having sex for validation i don't think it, i'm making bold statements here i guess but i don't think that it's possible to really get to that piece because we're wanting another's approval and we're wanting to be like seen in a certain way but for what and for you know for why and i think when we can tune into that process within our own selves it helps us to bring what's going on on the inside, like out into the body and through the body. And then it's like a, it's a very different process. And I think that that's yeah. like the heart of the, the work that I do for me and for other people. Mm. Beautifully said. I think for me, I, I usually frame this as pleasure versus performance validation even kicks it up another notch. I think for women, it's the same thing as am I good enough, but it, it typically plays out Diff a little differently and of course this is not um, across the board um, this is for all people am I doing it right do I smell okay do I taste okay do I look okay do I measure up to the standards that I'm buying into um, and I always say like I'm a huge fan of porn I'll use it in in for homework for some of my couples and I'm a huge fan of knowing what it's not, which mm -hmm. is that it is not about pleasure. It is about performance and it is about validation, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. these are actors doing their job. There is nothing real about what's happening there. Right. Um, so I feel like especially young people these days, like their sex education is porn because this country doesn't do anything to provide them with any real sex education that would be pleasure-based. Right. So really their default is into validation and performance. I agree. And in the porn space too, it's like as a, as a viewer, it's like we're seeing sex as like a physical reality um, alone. We're not really seeing the, the inner world or not at all seeing right. the inner world of these people, um, which is more immense than the physical act that's happening. So like we're seeing the surface of what's going on and then like indexing our own experience and comparing our experiences to this yeah. or like trying to replicate that. And it, that I feel like is like kind of the heart of validation. Like, do I look totally. like him? Am I gonna do you like he does you? <laughs> like, which is yeah. like so performative based. And that yeah. when I feel that come in, that's when I feel the least erotic and it like plagues me and it like really hurts my sense of eroticism, you know, when I'm operating out of that headspace rather than just feeling relaxed and open and just feeling good about it. And I think it's important for us to establish that link to pleasure because it really inherent in that, in my opinion, is this like self entitlement that's healthy. That's like, I deserve this. This is good for me. This is not shameful. Let's just do this. You know, it's a very yeah. open process um, rather than like squeezing it into little corners of my day and parts of my psyche that are, don't go in there. <laughs> yeah. Unless, unless we do, you know, like in it, yeah. in out maneuver yeah. versus just like, yeah, let's be open and free with our sensuality and. Perfect. Yeah. And I want to offer that this, this idea that we talked about is a beautiful one and it's not always accessible. So I know for myself, um, if I can't get into my pleasure mindset all the time because I'm distracted because of the validation piece or what I'm not doing enough of or think I look enough of, I focus on my partner. I'm like, mm. I'm just going to like take myself out of this a little bit and focus on giving pleasure for a while and almost always then the, the switch is flipped towards, mm. oh, I can just be and accept pleasure now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just a practice. So again, we are not setting this up as don't ever want validation or be performative because I think that's an unrealistic ask. 
It's mm -hmm. just practicing with it and at least having the awareness of it so that we can can need it when we need to. A hundred percent. And also even just like you know, saying that to your partner, if you can risk saying like, I'm really hung up right now and wanting to do you just right, you know, that can just look freeing to like, here's this yeah. inner process happening and here's what I'm doing with my body. And then the separation that that creates versus like, oh, join me in this and let's connect. And I'm having this feeling. And then your partner going like, oh my God, I want to be with me, you know, and then it's yeah. an invitation to connect. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Um, in, in your work, how do you think sex shows our deepest self? Oh, <laughs> um, because, okay, let me be succinct. It's because we, we start creating our narratives around sex uh, as little kids. Um, we are simultaneously as children, like, like importing so much stuff from like the environment around us. Um, all the messages, not only about sex, but just about how we are as people, you know, like, don't do this, don't do that. Kids, my dad used to say, children should be seen and not heard. It was like a mantra in the house, you know, so um, we create our identities to, to survive and to, to get what we need. And along with that identity and all those different formative places is our sexuality. And then we start to create, you know, experiences in our lives as we grow into adulthood and Every time we have sex, it's impossible not to be in touch with everything that's formed us along the way. And we're, yeah, we're in adult bodies and we're having new experiences, mm -hmm. but they're very much a part of like how we were formed and raised and it bears all those messages and all of our fears and also the things that we really want to uncover in ourselves growth wise that has nothing to do with sex, but is reflected through the sex that we're having. Yeah. Man, your, your answers have been so much deeper than mine today. Um, <laughs> when I think about this, this question, my, my go-to, so how do I think sex shows our deepest self? Um, when I've looked at myself and my history, when I look at my clients, I'm like, show me how someone lives life and I'll show you how they have sex. Mm -hmm. So if a person is anxious, that's going to show up in the bedroom. If mm -hmm. the person is grandiose, that's going to show up in the bedroom. Oh, if they're controlling, that's going to show up in the bedroom. <laughs> so I really like, so the sex therapy model, what makes it different than a, just a normal therapy model is we go for the sex first because of all of the information that it reveals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So go to the sex, look at the sex, see what's happening there, what's not happening there. And then you break down the relational and emotional patterns from mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Love so. it. That's okay. just as deep. It's just as deep. And I think too, like sex, I think of it in this way, this is metaphorical, but I think that it's like the erotic, it's like leading us and like pulling us to these places that really could be integrated if we look at it that way. If, like what you're if we allow ourselves to. Yeah, yeah. like, well, why yeah. am I that way? Why am I grandiose? Well, <laughs> like, oh my God. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let's see. How would you describe the difference between therapy and coaching? Oh, that's a tricky one. Well, therapy is its own, like psychotherapy is, a, is its own work. You know, it's like it's processes and um, a kind of holding the client in a particular relationship that isn't the same with coaching. I'm not doing all that. I'm not as skilled. I'm not, I haven't studied all of that. I have studied a lot of therapeutic modalities and utilized some of them, but it's a different kind of work. And in coaching, I think it's more directive. I'm like, here's some intentions i don't even like the word goals you know it's kind of like right right it introduces yeah. a kind of like failure maybe mindset but i like intentions like what is it you're going to work on let's like lay some of these things out and let's this month let's work on that you know it's very very it's directive and paced in that kind of way and i'll give them a host of exercises and things that i think would be really helpful for them to work on and to utilize and then we unpack it in a therapeutic way but it's not yeah. the same as a healing relationship with the therapist. And you could probably say more about that, about like the ongoing relationship that happens with the therapist for going back in time, essentially. Right. right. And like working on right. these childhood. Yeah. Issues. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You are a skilled, so it's not that it's just a different skill set. Um, and, and absolutely for me, the difference is history is historical. Mm -hmm unpacking the archaeological dig mm -hmm. as i understand coaching and i do have some coaching clients because they they don't they're not interested in the archaeological dig they just mm -hmm. want tell me what to do be more directive mm -hmm. like let's <laughs> solve this in real time mm -hmm. so therapy is past present future to me coaching is present future mm. so this is what's happening for now for me now i'm, I'm 
doing coaching sessions with you because this is what I want to happen. Mm -hmm. Therapy is more, this is what's happening for me now. And I have a feeling there's a link to my past that's mm -hmm. making all this shit storm happen. Mm -hmm. um, so let's bring that up, <laughs> integrate, it into, <laughs> integrate it into the present, and then really set those intentions for the future based on what we know, based mm -hmm. on now this knowledge that we have letting ourselves off the hook for our, why am I doing this? Why can't I do this? All these, all these pressures and hooks that we put in ourselves. If we look back to childhood, it's like, Oh, okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, totally. And I think it's impossible not to go back there. I want right. everybody to be in therapy. I wish everyone could be in therapy. <laughs> I think it's like a, a modern need that we have. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at our time here. Um, mm. Mm. Shin, is, how does this work kick your ass? I was going to ask you that question. Yeah. <laughs> um, it kicks my ass all the time because, you know, I actually feel like I'm finding myself through the work and I feel like working with men and hearing, you know, men have such a bad rap around like their feelings and they won't share them. I'm like in holding a space of compassion for them in this like way, like, well, yeah, of course not. And why? And that's like, and then once they actually let me in, it's just like, it's so magical. And so I, I love it. So I'm actually like, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's a really special sacred kind of relationship and space with, with what they're really going through. Cause I know what I've been through in myself and what I continue to go through. So I think, doing the work makes me have to be in my own process. I mean, I'm not like a coach because yeah. I have anything figured out as much as I'm like, I'm in the, I'm in this, who wants to be in this too? You know, kind of like, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's, the, that's how I look at it. You know, so I'm one of us and like working in, in that field of, of need and healing. And um, it highlights all of these fractures in myself. Mm. that I have to look at and be honest with, or I can't even be an effective coach or space holder. Right. I think that's like, you just nailed it. Um, how it kicks my ass. I think the best coaches and the best therapists need to be continually available to work on themselves. Like this is not, oh, I'm a therapist and now I know it all and I'm better. Mm -hmm. So I get my ass kicked because my clients reflect back to me things that I haven't taken enough time to look at in myself mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. for the last year I don't know for the last two years for the last two weeks it doesn't even matter but I just get reflected back if I feel that ping if mm -hmm. I feel that pain point it lets me know go back and do this again go back and look at this work so I think that's one way it kicks my ass is it's just a constant refocusing on your own stuff and stuff not in a bad way but just especially as a coach and a therapist we have to contain that maintain it in ourselves mm -hmm. um so we have to do the work if we're going to be good at our job because that's all about the other person and creating the relationship between ourselves and, and i'm this i'm the safe grounding person here mm -hmm. like i i've got to have this shit together mm -hmm. not completely clearly not completely but i've got to be able to hold that space with with awareness for, for what's happening in me. Yeah. Um, the other way it kicks my ass, um, it sounds crazy, but I, I kind of love being proved wrong. Uh -huh. I remember like my, the first bumper sticker that caught my eye as a teenager uh -huh. was, um, don't believe everything you think. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. And I still live by that. And I feel like therapy throws that in my face almost daily. Like mm -hmm. just when I think I've got it figured out, a client will say something, I'll be like, there's a new way of looking at that. I had never thought about that before. What if I add that to thinking about that in this way? So it's just, it's, oh, human beings are so interesting, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like they're, they're just, there's always something new. And I, I don't feel like I get shocked, but I continue to get more curious, especially when we talk about sex, the, the imaginative ways that people come up with to have sex, to think about sex, to be in sex. It's just, it's a really curious um, fascinating in the best kind of way, not like I'm looking at a zoo animal, but just that I'm looking at yeah. like, oh my gosh, this human being who is in either in so much pain or so much ecstasy, mm -hmm. and this is the way they're doing it and it opens up new worlds for other people to do it as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What else? Do we have time for one more? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was curious, you know, because one thing we had talked about, do you, are you ever shocked about what you hear? 
Not in a long time. Um, when I was uh, interning at a rape crisis center and, and very much new, green, mm -hmm. sh shocked in a painful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just shocked with what I would hear. I don't do crisis counseling work as much anymore, but I certainly, I work almost predominantly in sexual trauma. But I'm not shocked. Like, that's the wrong word for it. I'm sad. I'm... Mm -hmm open um yeah right now i'm stuck <laughs> but it's it's not a shock um and, yeah. and on the flip side of that if it's not the trauma if it's on what people do around sex with fetishes that really like it's just fucking interesting to me mm -hmm. like it's just really interesting you know all sex is good so sex as long as it's consensual and pleasurable yeah. just come right back to my sex positive stance and i'm like shit it's pleasurable for you. It's definitely consensual. Like this is good. Like let's mm -hmm. let's go there. Let's look at this. Right. Yeah. There's no value in creating like a a, a, a stigma around something if it's helping someone and feeling good or giving themselves permission and it's consensual. Right. It's like okay, they can always look at does this serve me all along the way in their own right. way. But if it's to feel right. good, yeah. Um, I also am not shocked. I mean, except what you were describing around crisis, you know, it's, yeah. I think sometimes being in touch with and being in contact with like the incredible darkness that's just as real as like the light of being, you know, alive and human and just yeah. the suffering. And that can be really, really hard to be in contact with it and not want to like, you know, pull. <laughs> um, but, mm -hmm. but I feel like we have to hold a space for that too, you know, um, for people individually in our work and also collectively yeah. and just it's a practice um individually yeah i'm not shocked when people tell me like kinks or something even if it's something that i've never thought of or if right. personally if my if finn were to do it would to be like ew i don't want to do that um when i'm listening to a client it's very different i'm just like yep. fascinated more i'm like mm -hmm. you, know, it's not, you know i'm not yeah. having to do this but i want to hear right. like how is this working for you and what are you getting out of that and where you know that's that's yeah, funny. because it's the bigger picture. It's not the behavior, it's the meaning. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what are you accessing with this? This is fascinating entry. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this has been so much fun. Uh, Finn, how can people find you? What's the best way for people to find you? Um, FinnDearheart.com. It's F I N N D E E R H A R T.com. And I'm also on Instagram, FinnDearheart. Okay. Uh, same story. Uh, DrHollyRichmond.com, D-R-H-O-L-L-Y-R-I-C-H-M-O-N-D.com, and at Dr. Holly Richmond on Instagram. So please, uh, I think through both of our websites, you can email us with questions. Mm -hmm. Through Instagram, you can message us questions, um, totally. however feels best for you. But uh, we love to talk about sex. We love to talk about relationships. We love to talk about intimacy and eroticism. Mm -hmm. So let us hear. Bring it. Yes. And thank you so much for doing this with me. This is fun. I always, every time I talk to you, I feel like, let's do more. Let's talk more. Let's yeah. talk more. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we're churning. Anytime. Yeah. We are. <laughs>